عليه والصلاة والسلام على من أرسله رحمة للعالمين وسماه في كتابه طاها وياسين البشير النذير والسراج المنير والطهر الطاهر والعلم الظاهر صاحب السكينة والمدفون في المدينة المنصور المؤيد والرسول المسدد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, elders, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is no human being who is remembered and is mentioned on a daily basis like this man. There is no human being who is inspired billions of human beings across the world like this individual. There is no human being who has made and caused such a transformation in the history of mankind like this particular individual. When we look at and admire and stand in awe of the personality of the greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Holy Prophet of Islam, Rasul al Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. One thing strikes us, and that is as far as his remembrance is concerned, it's something unmatched and unparalleled. I tell you, it doesn't need complicated maths to come to the conclusion that on a daily basis, the Prophet of Islam is remembered 18 billion times on a daily basis. Now you ask me how, I say to you, count with me. If out of 1.6 billion Muslims approximately, let's say 1 billion of them pray, let's say. And of course, when we come to the Salah, we find that in Surah to, in Salatul Fajr, the Prophet of Islam is mentioned twice in Tashahud, Sunni and Shia. In Salatul Dhuhr, four times. In Salatul Asr, four times. In Salatul Maghrib, four times. In Salatul Isha, four times. That makes it 18. And if you times 18 by the 1 billion, that's 18 billion times his name is heard across the globe. And that is something phenomenal. Not any other human being comes close to the Holy Prophet as far as their remembrance is concerned. And by the way, that's a promise of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because in the Quran, Allah says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We will make sure that your remembrance will be upheld and increases until the day of judgment. And indeed, the promise of God is absolute truth. When we look at this individual, it is not surprising that today, according to the BBC and other media outlets, the number one name given to newborn babies, not in Karachi or Baghdad or Najaf and Qom, but in places like London and Brussels, is Muhammad. And that is just a testimony to the growth and the strength and the way that this individual has captivated and inspired the hearts and minds of billions throughout history. There is, of course, no doubt about the status that our beloved Prophet enjoys when it comes to the Holy Quran, when it comes to history, when it comes to the narrations of the Ma'asumin themselves, because we have a beautiful narration that states that once Jibra'il and Israfil, the two angels of God, 
they were both somehow debating as to who is better in the eyes of Allah. This narration is found in Bihar al-Anwar. Israfil, who is the angel responsible for the blowing of the trumpet before the day of judgment, and of course, after the day of judgment starts, he says to Jibrail, I am better than you because I'm the last angel to stay alive and I blow the trumpet. Jibrail says, no, I am better than you because God has chosen me to send his message, his revelation to his prophets. And God has chosen me to make sure that when he wants to destroy communities, it happens through me. They came, and according to the riwayah, the riwayah is from another great individual who is the product, direct product of the greatest human being, whom we also celebrate in his wilada, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallam Imam al-Sadiq says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was asked by these angels, Jibra'il and Israfil, who is better, me or him? Allah says, by my might and glory, bi'azzati wa jalali, I have created what is better than you two. Then he reveals for them to see part of the arsh, metaphorically the throne of Allah, which states on it, la ilaha illallah, Muhammadun wa aliyun wa Fatima wa al-Hasan wa al-Husayn khayru khalqillah that Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan and Hussein are the best of the creation of God. And that highlights what? It highlights the status enjoyed by the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as -salam. because the riwayat tells us that one man who from the Jewish faith came to the Holy Prophet and said to him, you know, I must admit something to you. The Prophet said what? He said, you know, I find your name in the Torah. And every time I delete your name from it, I come back and the name is there. And what it says is that whenever he had a few questions and he presented it to the Prophet and the Prophet answered them all very well. And he said, whenever you are presented with questions, you answer them. But not only that, Jibra'il and this time Mikail will be next to you. And when you answer questions, who is sitting next to you normally? Your vicegerent, the one who is after you. The Prophet said, you're right. Because Jibra'il is here, Mikail is here. And look at that man. That man is God's representative after me. And they look and it's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ah. Ah. Another non-Muslim comes to the Holy Prophet and says to him, Ya Muhammad, I believe Moses was better than you. He says, why? He says, because Moses was able to make Bani Israel cross the sea. And he stopped the water from drowning them. Whereas you have not been able to do that. The Prophet said to him, oh so and so, listen to this. He said, when Adam wanted to repent, he asked Allah in the name of myself and my family. When Ibrahim was being thrown into the fire, he asked Allah to save him by my name and my family. When Nuh went on the ship and wanted to be saved from drowning, he asked God by my name and my family. And when Moses wanted to be saved from Fir'aun and not drowning, he asked Allah, he said, Oh Allah, I ask you to save me bihaqqi Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Isn't it? Then he says to this man, let me tell you this, that my son will rise to save this world from tyranny and injustice and behind him shall pray Isa. And therefore, you'll find one after the other, the narrations, of course, to emphasize whom indeed we consider as the best of creation and the final and the greatest of the messengers of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, there's no doubt that I could sit here and you've heard and we've come across so many lectures and narrations and stories in order to honor the great personality of the Holy Prophet and his Ahl al-Bayt alayhum as -salam. But I wish to focus in the next few minutes on a number of key elements that are contemporarily relevant to our lives today. Given and considering all the problems that many of us are indeed facing. Let me start by highlighting 
an important realization. If you have a five-year-old boy and you place this five-year-old in a room and you have also a 30-year-old man and you place them both in an experiment and you give them the microphone. The five-year-old has never seen a microphone before, so they get very excited. They start using it, they start hearing their own voice, and they generally become more and more happy. You give the microphone to the 30-year-old, they don't see it as anything special. They might come across a microphone before, they've attended programs, they've listened to perhaps things being said from a microphone. When they leave the room, if they both are asked, the child, the child is asked, what do you think of the microphone? The response from the five-year-old will be, it's amazing, it's great. You ask the 30-year-old, say, nothing special, isn't it? Now you take, for example, somebody who's never been to Egypt and you take them to their pyramids. They see the pyramids, they get so amazed by it, they look at it. And then you ask them, what do you think of the pyramids? They say, wow, it was something unbelievable. And then you ask someone who's worked there for 20 years, every day, every morning, going to the pyramids, cleaning or organizing things. And you ask them the same question, what is your opinion of this construction? They say, well, I think it's nice, but it's not really something special. Where do we want to go with these two examples? When it comes to our analysis of something, it really depends on a number of factors. Number one, our age. Number two, who we are. Number three, our previous experience. Yes, so a 30-year-old will not necessarily consider a microphone something great, but a five-year-old will. So it's all to do with what external factors that make us assess something, make us come to a conclusion about a being or what? Or a particular phenomenon. Now, why is this important? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says what? وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Ya Rasulullah, you have sublime, great morality. And when Allah says it's great, it's not the same when you and I say it's great. When you and I look at something and say, wow, it's amazing. That's a human perspective. But when our Creator says something is great, عظيم, that cannot even be compared to the human being's perception of something which is great. How magnificent was the akhlaq and the morality of the Holy Prophet for Allah to say it's something sublime. How great was it for Allah to praise it in such a way. You know, I have to say something in brackets here. You have to be very careful when it comes to comparing and somehow equating God with creation. Let me give you examples. Sometimes when we, for example, are in a graduation ceremony or birthday, whatever, we say, I would like to first of all thank God, secondly, my parents, thirdly, my friends, fourthly, my community. Have you heard this? A lot of people do it. When we produce, for example, on YouTube, you see these clips and people say, you know, recently I saw one clip, of, uh, of, a, uh, of a Muslim Shia brother who produced something and at the end he says, thank, uh, I would like to last but not least thank God for his blessing, yes? So we have this idea of thanking God first and what? And the other creation second. Our ulama say that's wrong. Theologically, that's unacceptable. The reason being is we are somehow placing the creator on a scale with his the created. They're saying first, second. The scale must not be there. It does not exist. We cannot place God on the same scale as the creation. So when we say thank you, we should say, I would like to start by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Above all, with no comparison. Yes? Not in a way make it one, two, three, four, five. This is a problem. Do you know why? Because how many times you've seen the translation of Takbiratul Ihram, Allahu Akbar, when we stand to pray, what is the translation of it? God is greatest. I've seen it on some Shia satellite channels. Yes, and non-Shia, others as well. They put it, God is greatest. Theologically, in terms of our aqidah, that's wrong. Because what are you saying? He's saying God, Allah, is greater than his creation. 
and therefore you're placing him on a scale with his creation. Our sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallam, was asked, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what does Allahu Akbar mean? He responds, Allahu Akbar min an yusaf. Allah is greater than being described other than what he has described about himself. In the Quran, who is permitted the ma'asumin to speak about him. That is the correct translation. Therefore, when we come to the Holy Prophet of Islam, when we look at this system of morality that he introduced and indeed established in society, not only over 23 years, but throughout his entire life, the fact that he is known as as sadiq al amin the honest, the, the truthful one, yes? The one that was trustworthy, no doubt. When we look at his personality, we come to the conclusion that when he comes and says, الأخلاق, I have been sent not to teach people akhlaq, not to introduce akhlaq, but I have been sent to complete and perfect the system of morality for mankind. That's what utamim makarim akhlaq means. If we go into Arabic, and I know it gets a bit difficult, but we realize the sensitive, delicate nature of the statement of the Holy Prophet. Number one, he says, li utamim, to complete and perfect. Secondly, he says, makarim. Makarim is not the same as mahasin. Mahasin means good akhlaq. Makarim means the highest levels of why is this all significant and important? Because today, my dear brothers and sisters, especially in the West, many are going through moral decline. Many are suffering with the infiltration of immoral acts. It is becoming more and more common to cheat, to deceive, to be hypocritical, to be untruthful, to lie, to steal. These things are becoming what? Easier for people to commit because they're surrounded by people who may not necessarily believe that this is part of their faith. It's something immoral, not right, but sometimes it's got to be done. Let me give you an example. When we look at the Muslim community generally in this country, yeah. What do we find? We find recently there's been statistics and examples presented to highlight immoral acts, deceiving, corruption, which has been present there. At the same time, crime. Now, I tell you, when this uh, gang were caught, you know, those nine people who were responsible for over 10 years for the rape, child prosecution, child trafficking, yeah, recently, from, I think, 2004 to 2014, they were convicted in this country. All were Muslim. I'm not trying to say that it is only us who are committing crimes. My point is, as a Muslim community, we have to rise above the others, especially those who consider ourselves the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, to rise above others when it comes to our conduct. Let me give you another example. I have a pharmacy degree. I used to practice as a pharmacist. And when I used to practice years ago, I used to look through this journal that they send us with the names of pharmacists that have been struck off because of certain acts that they've done against the law. It has to be severe for the authorities to remove their name from the register of being pharmacists in this country. In other words, they're not allowed to practice. Yes? And I getting them week after week at the end of this journal for the pharmacists who know the pharmaceutical journal and I look at it and there's Muslim names in there and one day I thought to myself you know what I need to sit there and count how many Muslim names there are of pharmacists being taken out and why should there be Muslim names but sadly there was a lot of Muslim names what does that say about the prophet of Islam being the highest example followed by the Ahlul Bayt of morality and us Muslims what are we doing with our system, our akhlaq, our conduct in society? Are we being individuals who are taking the Holy Prophet as the exemplary one, as the role model? Or are we just simply remembering him by name, admiring him, 
But in terms of walking the walk as well as talking the talk, we're not seeing actions on the ground. And yes, they're painful. Yes, what I'm saying hurts. But sometimes we need to look at our own conduct. And see, where are we? Are we doing things which displeases the Prophet Imam al-Sadiq and the Ahl al-Bayt? Are we doing things which are clearly against the law? And our maraja have said we're not allowed to do because you are a respectful, honorable member of this country and you need to respect the laws of the land provided they do not contradict what? They do not contradict Islamic laws. Yes? Honestly, sometimes the office of one of our maraja in London, they published this a few years ago. They said in Europe, do you know what happened in Europe? That one of the countries in Sweden specifically, they captured a gang, not a gang, but a system amongst the Muslim community there, specifically the Shia community. Yes? What did they find? They found that there was one individual who was issuing divorce, fake divorce, to some women, so that they go to the, to the authorities and say, you know, we're divorced, so we need to get more support. But they're still married. And this was going on for years and years until this man was exposed. Everyone else was doing it. We're exposed. And the maraja and the ulama were going, they're writing, this is haram. This is deception. To work and claim benefits which you should not be is deception, is haram. We're not supposed to do it. This is all violating what the Holy Prophet of Islam brought forward. This system of pure morality that was there because the Prophet of Islam didn't just say you should be of the best akhlaq. He actually acted upon it, isn't it? And that we are told that one day his uh, servant Anas ibn Malik says, I prepared the meal for the Prophet. He was fasting. You know, I prepared his iftar for him. But at the time of iftar, he didn't arrive. He didn't come. I waited an hour, brother, and then I thought, you know what, he's not there. So maybe he's been invited somewhere. He's gone somewhere to have his iftar. Therefore, I decided to eat the food. He says, later on, the Prophet came. We came, he saw there was no food. And he realized that I've eaten the food. What did the Prophet say to Anas? How did he treat him? Nothing. He said, Wallahi, the Prophet went to sleep hungry. He didn't say a word. And I was so ashamed, and I deserved to be told off because I had the food of the Prophet. There was no uh, chicken and chips places at that time. There was no takeaway, you know, call in a pizza hut. There was nothing. So the Prophet of Islam would have to what? Would have to sleep hungry. He goes to sleep. Now, this akhlaq, when it comes to treating others, who may have wronged us to start off with as the Quran informs and instructs the Holy Prophet of Islam that when it comes to forgiveness that is high in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't it the reality today is this establishment of sidq because the Quran says to us in chapter 9 verse 119 Ya ayyuhal this is a phenomenal verse, as all the verses of the Qur'an are. Why is it so important? Because Allah says, O oh, you who believe, be of those who practice God consciousness, number one, taqwa, no doubt. But secondly, وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ And be with the truthful, not one of the truthful. Because there's a very delicate difference in the Holy Qur'an. The Qur'an could have said, وَكُونُوا مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ and be amongst the truthful. But Allah says, find those truthful ones and associate yourself with them in that they radiate sidq and you become one of those who carry those flags. That you implement this truthfulness in society, you become a... Now, who these truthful are? People ask the question. Because, you know, the famous mufassir uh, 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 of the Quran by the name of uh, Allama Fakhruddin al-Razi, Today, his tafsir is considered to be one of the biggest in the Muslim world, followed perhaps by the majority of the non-Shia community. Yes, his tafsir is huge. When he comes to this particular ayah, he says, this is very important to understand. He says, this is instruction by God to find the truthful ones and associate 
themselves with them, number one. He says there must be an, a member of these people at all generations because Allah wouldn't say be with the truthful and they've all died or they've all passed away. They must still be alive in order for human beings to be able to connect or somehow be able to resonate with them. Yes? But then he says, well, I don't know who that person is, but the Shia belief is the, their 12th Imam. Yeah. Now, someone asks the question, when Allah says, be with the truthful, where is the evidence in the Quran to illustrate that it's the Ahl al-Bayt? Very simple. You look at Surah Ali Imran, verse number 65. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْا The incident of Mubahala, very well known, where the Holy Prophet of Islam faced the Christians of Najran and they wanted to take part in the malediction. The ayah finishes by saying, فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ We will send the la'na of God upon the group who are liars. Question, who were the liars? And automatically, if there is one side who are um, not the truthful, what happens to the other side? They are the truthful. Yes? And that's why when the Holy Prophet of Islam took with him Amir al muminin Lady Fatima, Imam al Hassan and Hussein, peace and blessings be upon them, all the Muslims wanted to be with the Holy Prophet. They said, We wish that we were taken by the Prophet of Islam that day. And indeed, this and so many other verses like Ayatul Taqir illustrate the fact that the Ahlul Bayt are the Sadiqeen because not a single error or sin emerged from them throughout their lives. And indeed, they were the truthful ones, not at certain stages, but completely. Yes, therefore, the reality that should hit hard is the ambassadorship that you and I claim to be when it comes to the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them all. Now, when it comes to the Holy Prophet of Islam and his description in the Holy Quran, specifically when it comes to this modern day time, there is one interesting term that the Quran uses to highlight who the Prophet of Islam is. Ya ayyuhan nabi, inna arsanna kashahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira. O oh, Prophet, we have sent you as a witness and the one who bears good tidings and good news. See, how many times when we as human beings receive good news, we become ecstatic. Ask those brothers and sisters on a Thursday in August when they're waiting for their GCSE or A-level exams results, yes? And they're waiting for that great news that they've, for example, attained several A's. Or they've attained the grades that they need to enter university. Ask the grandparents who are waiting to hear from the news of their son or daughter in hospital who's giving birth. Ask the businessman who is waiting to see that the contract that the other company is trying to sign has actually been signed, yes? And all of us in our lives expect and desire and yearn some great news, isn't it? Good news. But I tell you, sometimes good news may seemingly be good, but it's perceived by people to be bad. Let me give you an example. I've given this story before that it is said that one person, one day, one man was taking his wife to give birth in hospital. She was about to give birth. She was in labor. He took her to hospital and when he got to hospital, he said to her, I'm so sorry, I can't go with you. I can't be with you. I, I just can't. You know, some of the uh, men, they just can't stand the, the difficulty and everything else that they see. So he said, you know, I'll wait outside if that's okay. So she was taken inside. He sat next to two other men who happened to be also waiting for their wives to give birth. Yes. Apparently what happened a bit later, the midwife or the nurse comes out and says to the first person who is sitting and waiting, good news, your wife has given birth. Fantastic, let me go and see the child. She said, no, hold on, let me give you the full news. So what's the full news? She says to him, your wife has given birth to two children. Yes, twins. Wow, he looks at the two men who were talking, all of them. He says to them that, you know what, 
I feel this is a special day. Why? It is because I work for a company which is a hotel chain known as Double Tree. And because I work for Double Tree, I've been given two children. She goes away, no problem. Now after a while, this lady comes out, the same midwife nurse, and looks at the second man and says to him, your wife has given birth. He says, amazing, I'm so happy, this is fantastic news, let me go and see my child. She says, hold on, you're as hurried as the first man. So what's it? She, he says to him, you have been blessed with three children. He sits there um, in a state of shock and disbelief. He looks at this last man and he says, would you believe it? He says, why? He says, I work for a mobile company called Three. <laughs> and so he goes away. Now the third man, he stands up in this waiting area. He's sweating, walking back and forth. He's about to collapse and faint. Someone comes to him and says, are you okay? He says, wallah, I'm not okay. He says, why? He says, I work for Seven Up. <laughs> Sometimes good news may not be good news for people, yes? But when Allah says the Prophet is good news, it is definitely good news. Yes? The Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nabi, inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashira. You are going to give people glad tidings. And following the Holy Prophet is exceptional news. It is something that brings happiness, tranquility, success, to the life of the human being in this world and no doubt in the hereafter isn't it now one element that the prophet of islam emphasized my dear brothers and sisters i remember in the early 90s when i first came to the united kingdom i remember on a saturday morning when i trying to go to sleep because the rest of the days i had to wake up for school my dad would wake me up and say go to the local news agents and buy me the newspaper you know and I would say to him, why? He says, you know, maybe there's some news, I'm thinking about Muslims, something, you know, maybe we can read, maybe there's something that Muslims are mentioned. Today, there's no, you know, Muslims are on every page of the newspapers, isn't it? That we are being scrutinized, that we have been labeled, that we have been attacked, that we have been mocked, yes? Due to the increase in Islamophobia, due to the increase in acts being committed in the name of the religion of Islam and in the name of the Holy Prophet of Islam. Because I tell you, two years ago in 2014, YouGov, you've heard of YouGov, which is a body that establishes and conducts surveys in this country. It asked 6,000 UK citizens or people living in the UK about terms that they associate with communities. So they asked them, what is the most term that you associate with the Muslim community? What was the term? Terrorist. It's no joke. There is no joke that today we have my nine-year-old and seven-year-old sons in school after the atrocious Paris attacks were asked by their nine-year-old and seven-year-old friends, what do you think of ISIS? It is a conversation that even the children are having today. Yes, it is not something for us to run away or shun away. It's a responsibility. And indeed, we have come to a time where we can't hide ourselves anymore. We cannot cocoon ourselves. That we have to rise to the responsibility and understand the challenges that are facing us at all levels. Individual levels, family level, community level, society level. Yes, now I tell you. The problem that we have today as far as these individuals who have hijacked the beautiful name of the religion of Islam and the holy prophet of Islam and they're killing indiscriminately and they're so barbaric and inhumane that of course the majority of Muslims are rejecting them as well as the Shia predominantly rejecting their ideology and I mean what I say. Yeah. When it comes to that, what do we learn from the Holy Prophet of Islam that we need to do today? Because there are more than 600 verses in the Holy Quran, 600, that speak about one subject in which you will not find a group of people demonstrated it better than Muhammad wa al Muhammad. No one. And that's mercy, compassion, love, 
coexistence, tolerance. These are words we're hearing more and more these days, isn't it? In the media, or at least some Muslim leaders are trying to push this, to trying to say that, look, we have an individual like the Holy Prophet of Islam that was mistreated, that was abused, that was tortured. His family, his companions were what? Were hurt. Their belongings were taken away from them. Yet he returned on the eighth year after Hijrah, in the month of Ramadan, entered Mecca. He conquered it without shedding a single drop of blood. And there were all those people in front of him. And if he was in the mentality of these animals who are worse than animals, like Isis and Daesh, he would have beheaded them. But there is a man who is the mercy to mankind. And that's the Prophet of Islam, isn't it? He looked at them and said, you know what? Number one, he did not do anything to them. And number two, he did not force them to become Muslim. It's an important realization. He said to them, go, if you wish to do whatever you want, as long as you do not spread this corruption or falsehood in society, go in certain places in the house of Abu Sufyan or wherever you are in these particular designated areas, you can go. Now the key element today is to understand and to appreciate the mercy of the Holy Prophet. And the fact that his speech, his conduct was that of love and compassion. And that must translate in our terminology and the way we conduct ourselves with others too. This is very, very critical, especially from a young age, for the children. Because you know what happens? And we'll say this very boldly. Sometimes, inadvertently, we reflect the way we think to our children at home. Something comes up on the TV of a group of people that we do not necessarily like. Or oh, these are so-and-so. And they'll learn. Yes, they'll go to school and they say, well, you know what, that's what our parents taught us. The way we look at other communities, other individuals, other religious groups, even people within the religion of Islam. Yes, let's talk intellectual and let's talk academic. I'm not saying start praising X, Y and Z for the sake of tolerance. No, 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 no. This is not what we are referring to. We are referring to the idea that we have to inculcate for, for our children in order for us to survive and to strengthen our position in the West. The notion that the Prophet of Islam and the Ahlul Bayt demonstrated and that's love, tolerance and coexistence with other communities that we disagree with. I disagree with a particular ideology. But I'm not going to look down upon them, neither teach my children hatred and venom against those people who may be misguided. They themselves may have received the wrong information or the wrong teaching, so to speak, according to us. Yes, but we keep our options in, t in terms of we are a school of thought that espouses dialogue and coexistence as far as discussions are concerned as well, and as well as debates. The message today is this, that, you know, I was looking and, and, and reading through the biography of the Holy Prophet. There is an area that perhaps many of us would, would frown upon if it's taught. Imagine you hear a majlis on the animal rights in Islam. But do you know why I mentioned this? There is a hadith that is found in Sunni and Shia books in Imam Muslim's uh, compilation in uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal Musnad in, in Alama Tabarsi Bihar al this hadith that one day the Prophet of Islam saw some people had a hen they placed it and they were shooting at it you know just the game shooting at it he walked past and said who are these people they said this 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 man he then raised his hands he said may Allah send their na'na upon these people hold on but it's an animal if the Prophet, and you know, we have so many narrations about the rights of animals. Don't ride it too long in case, you know, uh, it gets too tired. Make sure that, for example, you do not slap it unnecessarily, unless, you know, if it's too gently to make it move. For eating, him, he, he saw him, uh, they saw him eating one morsel of food and, and putting another for a cat in front of him, a particular animal. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, you know, why are you doing this? He says, I am embarrassed before God that there is a creation of his that's watching me eat and it's hungry and I don't share my food with it. How many of us would be doing that? 
Yes? The key element today is that we have to raise the bar in our discussions, in our presentations, in our ethos, and in our conduct when it comes to society. And it's not only us in terms of acting in the back foot. No. We should seize this opportunity to be able to advance and propagate the teachings and the personality of the Holy Prophet. And I say this with full conviction and a humble advice to my brothers and sisters and du'as for myself uh, to act on it before saying it. But we have to be individuals who are proud of our faith and our beliefs. This day and age more than any other. For our sisters, may Allah bless them. For those who are wearing hijab and they're out there, they're easy targets, no doubt. But for every moment they're out there, the reward is what? So great in the eyes of Allah because they're ambassadors for the religion of Islam. Yes? For everyone who's keeping faith and speaking to people, I'm a Muslim, I'm proud of it. I follow the Ahlul Bayt and I'm proud of it. Let me tell you this. That in two, uh, a month ago in Iraq, when we met several of the Maraja and Najaf, they emphasized this. Now more than ever, other, at other times, Muslims, Shia in the West must introduce themselves as Shia. Because the picture is blurred out there. Everyone's being painted with the same brush. It's not to counteract or to go against unity. No, not at all. This is not to somehow blame a community. Not at all. It is being proud of the faith, but also not only wearing the badge of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt with pride and honor, but acting on it. Because our sixth Imam says, Kunu lana zaynan wa la takunu alayna shayna. Be a best example for us. Don't be a source of disgrace. Hatta yaqulu nas May God bless Ja'far ibn Muhammad. He knows how to train his Shia. He knows how to bring and raise them up and keep them at that particular level. Today, our challenge, my dear brothers and sisters, before we end is this, that in our, and across our dealings with society, starting with our own family members, in the community, wherever we are, we have to be individuals who understand what is it about the responsibility that we have in being the followers of the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt. Because, you know what the Ahl al-Bayt highlighted? They highlighted the need to create and build a strong, cohesive community. Today, more than any other time, we have to work for that. Work together. Put aside our you know, differences in terms of who should be doing that and that. We have to be thinking far ahead for our children in terms of organizing activities, programs to strengthen their aqidah, to make sure that their understanding of religion is sound, to answer the misconceptions that they may be facing everywhere, at work, at university, at school. Yes, but importantly in the English language. It's all very good to have programs in Arabic, in Farsi, and Urdu. They should continue. English should never be seen as a threat to other languages, but it should never be replaced. It should also be there in terms of providing a platform for people to be able to what? To understand their faith and to be able to present their concerns, present their challenges that no doubt many of us face in our lives in different shapes and forms at this juncture and of course as we are celebrating the auspicious wilada of the holy prophet of islam as well as our sixth imam imam ja'far al-sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi wa with us facing so much difficulty and oppression and bloodshed in across the world with many suffering it is not a time to be despondent, my dear brothers and sisters. I leave you with this beautiful verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you and I to be inspired. You know, wants us to, to keep the light in our hearts. He says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Do not despair, do not grieve. You are the best, you are the highest in the eyes of God if you're truly believers. If you're going through hardship, don't worry. Because other communities have also gone through hardship. And Allah makes it go through different times. Yeah? 
Today, we seize this opportunity. Sometimes we need to be shaken as a community. And if we see that there are challenges out there, as far as the way Muslims are perceived, as far as the way Muslims are demonized in the media and in other parts, if we see our scholars being executed, yes, in certain parts of the world, if we see our brothers and sisters being blown into pieces in other parts of the world, this should give us the resolve, the commitment to what? Not to just become further and further despondent and hide within our shelves, but to appreciate that we have the greatest benefit, uh, the greatest blessing, and that is to be considered to be the followers of the Holy Prophet and his Ahl al Bayt. This ni'ma of wilaya that our six Imam says to one of his companions. What does the verse وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَتِي رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ Speak to people about the favor of your Lord. That companion says, Oh Imam, I think it's life. He says, No. He says, I think it's health. He says, No. He says, I think it's wealth. He says, I know. He says, I don't know. He says, Look at the Quran. Allah gives you the answer. Imam al-Sadiq says, If you look at chapter 5, you find... اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي that on the 18th of the الحجة 10 years after Hijrah on the plains of Ghadir Allah says my ni'mah has been completed and Imam says when Allah says speak to people about my ni'mah that's the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad صلوات الله وسلم I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the strength to be able to rise to the occasion, to be individuals who follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet in terms of our akhlaq, in terms of showing love and mercy, in terms of building a strong community, in terms of indeed being the best that we can be. I pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can learn from the Holy Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq to be able to perform the ziyarah of the shrine of the Holy Prophet and the demolished shrine of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq in Jannat al and to see the day in which the shrine of Imam al-Sadiq and the Immat al is rebuilt once again. We pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt, specifically in Iraq and also in Sham for Sayyida Zainab and Sayyida Ruqayya Sakina. We pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to see the day in which the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman in the, inshallah will reappear and for us to stand in support and to be able to sacrifice everything that we have to establish and spread justice and equality. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the forgiveness of our sins. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with the wonderful community here in Blackburn that uh, I pray for inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this community and to make it go from strength to strength. I ask you to remember uh, the shuhada, the maraja, all your marhumin was surah al-mubarakat al-fatiha but before that the loudest of salawah.